Powered by GoGo Sports in partnership with TSN, it is episode 72, season 4 of the Ray and Riggs Hockey Podcast, and as always, proudly presented by our title sponsor, Canadian Club Whiskey. Ray, we'll get to high headlines in just a moment, and, and part of that will be the acknowledgement of, I don't know if it was if it's fair to call it a bold prediction made by you, but you did say going into the Stanley Cup final that it would be Vegas in five, and I guess that would be out of respect to the Florida Panthers. You know, I, I, they're going to win a game. It's not like they're going yeah. to be a sweep. But what we saw in game five, man, that was just sheer dominance again. Well, um, I just, you know, I did the Vegas series against Dallas, and they just looked so good. Oh. And they were they're so big, and they were just relentless in the way they played. And when when they needed – their goalie to be good, he was really good, but they just dominated the the team game, and I just mm. felt like Florida was. It just felt to me they were getting to the point they were on fumes. Like they, yeah. I, I I can't, I I can't imagine how many times it must have felt like they were pushing the boulder up the hill, and yet they got it up the hill again. Like yeah. It, it was every series it felt like they were just an inch from it going the wrong way. And yet they pushed through again. I just felt they were out of gas. So that's why, that's yeah. why to me, it made sense. Uh, I, I think a, I, well more than half, I think thought Vegas was going to win. They just felt it was deeper in the series. I just didn't, I didn't think Vegas had, or uh, Florida had much left. And as it turned out, they, they really physically didn't. Yeah, we'll get to the injuries here momentarily. And uh, I know that, you know, you view, feel the same of Paul Maurice that I do. One of our favorite people. You know, terrific guest. So well-spoken. So good for the game. Does he play the media on occasion? Sure he does. Most NHL coaches and, and the experienced players do. Um, you probably caught his post-game interview with Jackie Redman right. last night. You know, for him to go through the emotional run that dates back to the regular season, right? And the investment from the coaches, from the players, from the trainers, from management, from everyone, and then have the presence of mind to not only roll through the list of injuries, but to put it in perspective and, and still acknowledge how proud he was of that group mere minutes after losing the Stanley Cup final. There's no more games to play this year. Again, that speaks at least to me, a person who knows him pretty well, of where Paul is in his life. Like he's at peace, right? He recognizes how difficult it is to go deep into the playoffs. Disappointed, oh boy, beyond belief. But also taking stock of the experiences and how tightly together that group of Florida Panthers is now moving forward. Yeah, I, I when I kept looking at him, I, I kept going back to when he left in Winnipeg. You know, when he said, I just, you know, it's yeah. time for a change. And as, as much as it was time for a change from, uh, for the Winnipeg Jets, it was time for a change for, for Paul. Like he, you know, he needed to step away. He needed to, he did. yeah, you know, just to, I, I hate to refresh and recharge. I mean, like he just, he just needed to get away from mm -hmm. the game. And, you know, he had a great line uh, somewhere and he said, uh, you know, I was, I was tired of catching fish every day. It was, it was time to, it was time to get back in. And then the opportunity in Florida came and he did just a, you know, he did an amazing job. I, I think it was a masterful job of coaching, manipulating a roster that, that was undermanned, undersized, under health, if that's a word, yeah. Um, yeah. all of it. I, I just, I thought he and his coaching staff did a, they did a really great job, and then of course it gets to the players that were yeah just magnificent in in the way that they played. I mean, they I I don't know how Florida can look at that, uh, and I, I mean I know how they can be disappointed, but sure. how how they they can't be just immensely proud of what they did because at the end of the day they ran into a bigger, better, faster team like the yeah. the best team. For yeah. the last two months was the Vegas Golden Knights. And agreed. And they deserve to win. All right. Well, perfect segue to headlines. And and 
So take us back to your playing days here. And, and maybe you had similar experiences. I mean, you didn't hoist the Stanley Cup, but you played on some pretty good teams at varying stages of, of your career. So imagine what it must have been like and is like as a player right, for to play for an owner who is as committed as Bill Foley. I, I mean, to, to make the prediction that he made early on, you know, we're going to win it no later than year six. Well, it's year six. Um, so he's committed in every way to win. That empowers management, George McPhee and Kelly McCrimmon, to go out there and focus on that standard, right? And that includes making some very unpopular decisions. You know, the Marc-Andre Fleury saga, but not popular. You know, the fact that they dispatched Gerard Gallant, you know, a popular coach, uh, hired Pete DeBoer because they felt tactically Pete DeBoer would give them more than what they had in in Gallant. Well, then they fire Pete DeBoer and they replace him with Bruce Cassidy, um, who maybe was the missing piece in several different ways. So, you know, long-winded way of asking this, like how good would you feel as a player to be in an environment like that where you knew the coach was the right coach and management was going to do everything possible to help you win a Stanley Cup? Well, it would be remarkable, you know, to have the resources to do it, the wherewithal to do it, mm -hmm. the the ability to stand back and let your managers do their thing, because they weren't they weren't, you know, taking pitches to the opposite field for a base hit here. I no. mean, they they swung big a lot, and I, I so in this. It does, I think it's faded a little bit, but it still bugs me how people think that Vegas was gifted a Stanley Cup roster. Mm -hmm. Go back to that roster. Just look at it. Yeah. The, the first year. Yeah. And you tell me who thought that was a Stanley Cup roster because I can remember when they came out of the blocks and nobody gave that roster a second look. No. And so what the league did just a little revisionist history, I guess, is that they looked at Columbus, they looked at Minnesota, who, even though they were successful, nobody could watch because they were like, oh my God, they're so boring. Then they had our glorious experiment in Atlanta and they were like, wait a minute, we're going to charge somebody 500 or $600 million to come in. They need to have access to better players. Yes. Yeah. I think two things happened here in Vegas that allowed them to win in six years. One is... They got to start from scratch. They mm -hmm. had nothing that they had to get off the books. And in the salary cap world, we know that's incredibly important. There was nothing there that they didn't want. Mm -hmm. And then if they wanted to move it, they didn't have lingering dollar penalties sitting behind them of retained money and stuff like that. That's number one. Number two is they got to a point and they went, you know what? We're pretty good. We need a top end defenseman. They went and got Petrangelo. Mm -hmm. Then they decided they needed a uh, more to their leadership core. They went out and swung big and made that trade with Ottawa for Mark Stone. Then they still a pretty good team, and they're like, we we don't have a number one center. We've got Chandler <laughs> Stevenson and we got William Carlson, and that was there was risk to that trade to Jack big for Jack risk. Eichel. Yeah, like what if the surgery didn't allow Jack to play? Like we just watched him play for two months. And all of those things sit at the top of the big swing category. And then there's Chandler Stevenson that, you know, was, I think he was a fifth round draft pick is what they, they yeah. traded for. Aiden Hill yeah. was a fourth round draft yeah. pick. Yeah. Quinton Howden became a really effective player. Go through their roster. They don't have a lot of draft picks on that roster. Yeah. They went and they churned that roster looking for the right mix. And it was bold and it was big and it's not always popular. Like around the league, they're, I wouldn't say that teams look at them and go, oh, they're our favorite group. And mm -hmm. it's because they are they are ruthless in their approach. Yeah. And you know what? They they hit on almost every number. Yeah. And to to win from, from zero to six years and to win is is pretty remarkable. Yeah, look, I mean it's it's kind of Jimmy Rutherford in his heyday, right? Like you know, in that he he would identify a need, 
make a trade. Great. If it worked, perfect. Then we're set. Now let's focus on another area of concern and let's try and fix that area too. And if you swing and you miss, all right, well, we'll fix it. We'll try something else. I mean, look at the carousel of goalies that the Vegas Golden Knights had to play with, you know, at varying points this year. But I don't know that I've ever been more impressed with the evolution of a player in the postseason than I am with Jack Eichel. And and the offensive side of this game, when he was healthy, I mean, we could see that he was going to be a dynamic NHL star. We could see that. Um, sure. But then he had his share of issues, you know, that, that have been well documented in Buffalo. It just didn't seem to be the right fit. But as you talked about, you know, there was far from any guarantee that that the surgery that he had was going to work, that he was going to be able to withstand the rigors and the wear and tear of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And he did all that, but on top of it, he turns into a hell of a two-way hockey player, right? Where the importance of, of the defensive responsibilities of his job meant as much to him, evidently, as generating the offense. And he was able to do both almost masterfully at times. I don't think you can be great at anything if you don't, if there's no inspiration. Yeah. Um, lots of people put the per perspiration in. Lots of people work hard. Lots mm -hmm. of people do the best they can. But there needs to be an inspiration to it. And I think looking at Jack's career over a bigger picture, it's pretty clear the inspiration faded. And missing the playoffs year after year after year after year in Buffalo, then I mean, that takes you to the injury, but prior to that, it felt like, it felt like he had flattened out. Yeah. And to go to Vegas to, you know, it's a second chance health wise, because he, he really held for the type of surgery that he wanted to get. And that, you know, like that was hard to do because it wasn't a real popular surgery at the time. I mean, there's been a few surgeries like it since, but he goes to Vegas and then he's just inspired Dregs in this yeah. in this atmosphere that we just talked about of mm -hmm. the building of the team and the way that the team is. And they need him to be, you know, a a complete player. And it was it's easier to do that when you're inspired. Yeah. Don't forget, he this is I think a true mark of how good Vegas was this year. Jack Eichel was their leading scorer. He had 66 points. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 66 points led that team in scoring. And Kelly McCrimmon went through it at the end of the game. I saw, you know, his interview, which, by the way, was excellent with, yeah. with uh, David Amber and, and Elliot um, talking about his mom and dad and his, you know, his late brother, the his Brad McCrimmon, who we all just loved. Yeah. But um, and, and how they're both on the Stanley Cup. You know, it's just it's just a remarkable story. But Kelly was talking about how how they all had to piece this thing together and everybody had to to pull at a different time. And in the Dallas series, you know, in game six, it was Nick Waugh's line. And, you know, it was Chandler Stevenson's line at one point. It was Eichel's mm -hmm. line at another point. It was William Carlson's line in the Edmonton series. It was it was a bit of everything. And man, that's a deep steamroller looking team I'll tell you they were I was just so impressed in that Dallas series because they they got up three nothing they kind of fell asleep and all of a sudden it's three two they go back to Dallas and it was over yeah it like was over six there. minutes finished yeah. and it was it was impressive you know we're supposed to be jaded media we're not supposed to have emotions we're not supposed to invest I mean we cheer for good stories that's what we cheer for you know Times individuals, seldom teams, right? No skin in the game yeah. for either one of us. But, you know, it's been an interesting few days, right? And I'm finding myself watching TV. You know, obviously the 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 putt that Nick Taylor made from 72 mm -hmm. feet to win the Canadian Open. I mean, I'm sitting there kind of huffing a little bit because yeah. it's it's just such a moment. And, you know, I get that almost annually with the Stanley Cup. Because you do see the investment of the players and listening to, you know, you described the interview that that Kelly did with David and, and with Elliot was was terrific. I've known Kelly a long, long time, and that's heartfelt. That's genuine. Um, Petrangelo doing the interview, you know, talking about his daughter mm. and, and you can see how emotional he got. 
Um, for me, that's where, and then let's shift over to Florida and the list of the injuries. I, I think people have an appreciation for what these players have to go through, but then you see it at the end when it sinks in and the emotion bubbles to the surface because they have lives. Stuff matters. Like for a period of time for Alex Petrangelo, playing in the National Hockey League didn't matter to him, right? Mm. He had a daughter that was sick, really ill, and that was where his attention, you know, had to be. And then you 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 look at the list of injuries from Florida. Uh, I mean, when, when Paul Maurice rhymed off what Aaron Ekblad was dealing with, with two shoulder separations, um, the torn oblique, uh, a bad foot, you know, concussion test. I mean, what else? And and, and Matthew mm-hmm. Kachuk with the fractured sternum. Yeah, I mean, these are these are injuries, Ray. That would what take you out of a regular season for at least several weeks. You know, in oh, certain oh, cases, sure. months. Yeah. It's yeah, crazy. For sure. Add in Anthony Declare. They didn't have Etu Lesterinen <laughs> in the in the final. You know, he was mm-hmm. injured in. You know, Gudis uh, with a high ankle last, sprain. Last I mean, series and, it's crazy. You know, it's it, it it is pretty remarkable that what you can will yourself to do, mm. uh, if it's if the task is important enough, and and the, those guys they go through this for two months and they're never going to take a backward step until there's no steps to take. It's just just so it I mean look I got I got to play so I don't know maybe my appreciation's a little different to just how hard it all is and realizing that there's lots of years you don't have a chance yeah. because your team's just not good enough or you're not in the right place whatever it is I, I told Cammy this yesterday when they were bringing the cup out I said you know I remember the first time that I ever saw the Stanley Cup and this will probably surprise you Um, it was in New Jersey. Um, it was 2003. Mm -hmm. So I had played 18 years in the NHL and retired. Never seen the Stanley cup, never seen it live. Yeah. Never seen it in person. Hadn't been to the hockey hall of fame. Um, they, they wheel it out and it's underneath the stands and I've got to get to a place where now I'm broadcasting. I'm going to do an interview after the game. And I walked by it and it was on its table uh, in the old Brendan Byrne Metal Lands yeah. Arena, whatever the hell it was called at the time. And it was just sitting there. And there was, you know, people were five or 10 feet away from it, but it was just like it was on display. And I walked by it, Dregs, and I stopped and I, <laughs> I felt like a little kid. And my first thought was, <laughs> it's so shiny. <laughs> I, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, this is like, I was emotional looking at the thing. And I, you know, I would never get a chance to hold it or, or play for it again. And I was like, uh, it was just so, it, what that trophy looks like and matters and means is, it's different to me than anything else. For sure. Anything else. There's nothing even close to it. And when I saw it again last night, I was like, man, I, every year I just am huh. so envious. And I, I did mention yesterday, I want to mention here, a, a good buddy of our of our family, Craig Cunningham, is a pro scout in, in Vegas. And uh, for those that don't know, Craig had a terrible incident on the ice many, many years ago and collapsed and went into a coma and ended up having part of his leg amputated. And he is the most positive, relentless resilient person I know I just love the guy and he's a pro scout with Vegas and uh he's a Stanley Cup champion his contributions mm-hmm. like Kelly mentioned to all those scouts is is paramount to building a team but I was just so happy for for Craig he's just an amazing guy yeah and see that's why you cheer for individuals right yeah, yeah. it's awesome uh John Marsh still wins the con Smythe I don't think anybody was surprised, disappointed, any of that. What, you know, at the end of the day, what does it really matter? But I think what, what the process speaks to is likely how tight it could have been, right? So, you know, Marceau had a real good run after the, the first round, scored a ton of goals, delivered, you know, you know, a collection of points. I mean, he, he, for me, he was 
undeniably a top candidate for Conn Smythe going into game five. But then, you you know, you had the Eichel story and his contributions and Aiden Hill, you know, made mm-hmm. his way into the conversation. And our pal Dave Poulin in our pregame coverage said, nah, I get it. I understand all that. Mark Stone is going to win the Conn Smythe tonight. And- oh, that's OK. I'm going to stop you right there. <laughs> that is such a pooly choice. Yeah. So the underdog. No, okay. no. Pooley and I look at the game 180 degrees apart. You'll have to ask him about this. So he would say, when I was doing a Leaf game, I would say something about a play that had been made. And at the same time, Pooley in the studio would say something from the defensive player's side. <laughs> he looks at it one way. Of yeah. course he would vote for Mark Stone. And <laughs> of course I would vote for a small goal scorer. <laughs> like, so, but who the hell is going to get to win a Stanley Cup with one player? Yeah, yeah. no chance. Like, I mean, I, I think Mark Stone was going to shoot at that empty net seventy four times last night. <laughs> it before, looked like it <laughs> before it finally, you know, he finally cashed in. But all through that run, like you, you meant the guys you mentioned, Drake's. Come on, like I know each one of them made just significant contributions. But I'm telling you, there's there's nothing harder in the game than to score, and to score at the rate that Marcia so scored. Um, uh, to me, Drama. he was he was my he would have been my pick. Um, Eichel would have been next, but um, man, that's uh, there's probably not a lot of spread as no. as people are rolling around in their head. There's 18 people that vote, yeah. and um, they try to you know try to decipher the the best candidate. All right, uh, we'll break away from the Stanley Cup because I do want your thoughts on Michael Landlauer finally getting the, the letter of agreement signed and eventually he'll get control of ownership of the Ottawa Senators. But is there a takeaway from this Stanley Cup champion Vegas Golden Knights team? Because every year we look for the copycat sort of, of, of model, right? You know, what will other clubs try and steal, take away from the structure of the Golden Knights? I don't know. How do you emulate the approach from management and others? I mean, you can't really, right? You either are aggressive and have the opportunity to be aggressive as an NHL organization, or maybe mm-hmm. you don't. And and so will there be some sort of copycat takeaway or this one's just too hard to follow up on? No, I think, uh, I, I think teams that try to copycat a Stanley Cup winner are a loser every time. Yeah. Because you don't have the same people. You don't. Yeah. You could have somebody in the same framework as Alex Petrangelo, for example. Right. But it's not Alex Petrangelo. You could have somebody in the same framework as Jonathan Marchesso, but he's not Marchesso. He doesn't have his heart. Doesn't have his drive. Doesn't have Petrangelo's smarts in that same framework. So <clears throat> I I think when when you go in, you look at your roster. This is what we have. What are our strengths? What can we identify? Uh, as our strengths, what are our weaknesses? Mm-hmm. Can we plug those weaknesses without taking away from our strengths? How can the ownership emulate it? That's the easy part, actually. Mm-hmm. It's just you have to be willing to do that and spend to do that. And nobody can tell an owner how to spend their money. No, yeah. you know, like I'm, yeah. everybody looks at it differently. Some teams feel like you need to have a lot of draft choices. I think we talked about there was three uh, draft choices with. With Vegas, they built their team differently. So, you know, Michael Andlauer is going to go in there and heck, by the time they get this thing finalized, Dregs is, it's pretty unlikely there's any, any change, correct? For the most part. I mean, Barbashev, are they going to be able to sign him? No, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In Ottawa. Oh, sorry. Uh, Yeah. Until they get to the end of the summer, right? Yeah. Until they get to the end of the summer. And then, I don't know that's going to satisfy the fan base there. I, for whatever reason, they, they seem to be sensing blood in the water. Uh, and I get it. You know, Steve Stayhouse is working with uh, the Edmonton Oilers. They're in scouting meetings, for heaven's sakes, in, in BC. And we know the history, the connection to Ann Lauer there. So maybe in time. But Ann Lauer won't get control until August, maybe even September. And mm-hmm. in the meantime... Pierre Dory and the GM of the Sens has a lot of work to do, right? So I just, I'm glad the saga is over 
you know, it, it needed to end for everyone's kind of peace of mind. And I would have picked Mike Landlauer because of his history with the league as a front runner going in. So with all due respect to all the other bidders, and there was significant money involved here, um, I, I think that this this is probably the best option moving forward for them. Well, it'll be, um, you know, I, the excitement of the new ownership brings hope. Yeah. Right? And yeah. one of my favorite movies is uh, Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Hope is a good thing, Red. Hope, <laughs> sometimes it's the only thing. <laughs> and um, I, I, I'm I excited for them. They've, you know, it's been a long run here and they've been in the ditch for a while and they started to put some really great pieces together and the next step we'll, we'll see, but there's a lot of people that'll be sitting around all summer in their quiet moments, wondering what's going to yeah. happen when, you know, like, will they bring in new people? Will they run forward with, will DJ Smith be back as a coach? Can you sign people to extensions? Probably yeah. not. You know, it's it's an right. uncertain time until they really get full full control. All right, real quick uh, for fans of the Calgary Flames and the New York Rangers, a couple of coaching hires with Peter Laviolette going on to the New York Rangers bench, not overly surprising, and, and nor was it surprising that Ryan Husk is promoted, you know, as head coach in Calgary. What do you think? Well, I'll start with uh, Laviolette, and it, it, the, the strangest part of this mm-hmm. thing for me is, you know, he – that had been out there for a month and why did it take so long to push it across the finish line? Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious and that probably never find out, but I'm, I'm curious as to what the, the delay was in, you know, in, in pushing it over the line. Now does, does he bring in a whole new coaching staff? Does he have, is it a mix and match? Does the, does the management pick some of the assistants? We'll, we'll see there. Um, as for Calgary, um, Ryan Huska, uh, um, he's a really terrific guy. Yeah. He really is. He's a good guy. Um, his dad was uh, was the head of the police in Trail. Oh. And so when Ryan was a little kid, so everybody would be like, oh, Sergeant Huska's around. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and his dad was just watching the game, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, he's just watching his kid play. So. Um, <laughs> I've I've known Ryan for a while. He's been um, you know, was a has been a winner everywhere he's gone. And it it seemed after, you know, they moved on from Daryl Sutter that they, they weren't gonna go for, you know, down the road of a high priced um you know, older coach. And so right. there's a first timer, a first time yeah. head coach at the NHL level. And um I liked what I heard from him yesterday. Uh, the acknowledgement they've got a good team and liked a lot of what they did, but they've, they've got to find a way to, to do a few things a little better. And I, I just, I just liked his demeanor and his approach. Yeah. And so we'll, um, those are two of the latest hires. Yeah. And, and look, in both cases, and I'm not saying this because I, I want to point out a, a negative aspect to the process. It's, it's just reality. Ownership was heavily involved, right? I mean, you need ownership approval and uh, I'm fine with that. And, and I'm interested. I'm intrigued by the direction of the Calgary Flames. There's a lot of cap work that needs to get done there. But at least now they've got uh, all the bases covered from coaching and uh, management. All right, let's uh, move forward. Those are your headlines.